Good. Glad you're here. You made it. Yeah. I um, before we jump into the message, I just want to catch everybody up on sort of our the posture that our church family is taking uh, in the midst of the coronavirus and all the different things that are happening. So uh, we believe the church has a unique opportunity uh, in a situation like this. And so what we want to offer and the reason why we're here today and the reason why we're online, hi everybody online in your pajamas, Um, the reason why we're here is because we know that people need to hear a message about a couple things. People need a reason not to be afraid and people need something to do, an action step to take. And uh, we we believe that we, we have both of those. Those are, those are pretty easy for us. One of the most common phrases in all of Scripture is, don't be afraid. Fear not. Be not afraid. And it's really fascinating to, uh, to notice that in some of those situations, it seems like there was a lot of good reason to be afraid. <laughs> it wasn't that there wasn't any danger. There were moments when the disciples are on a boat in the middle of a storm, you know, and you think... Yeah, it's reasonable to be afraid. And Jesus says, don't be afraid because I'm here. Joshua is getting ready to lead the children of Israel in a battle against a people who are stronger than them. That seems like a good reason to be afraid. And yet God says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. And so the answer to don't be afraid is always because God is with us. So we don't, we don't have to be afraid. We're going to be wise, and we're going to make good choices, and we're going to respond in a way that is loving and kind, but we're not going to do that out of fear. We're going to do it out of love, kindness, and grace. And so we don't, don't need to be afraid, but we do need to take some action. I believe that the church has a unique opportunity to take some action that can be a blessing to our community. So we want to invite you into a few different opportunities to serve your community during this time. One of the needs that we've recognized uh, already is that uh, some people uh, either shouldn't go out and run errands or are, are not comfortable doing so. And so we want to provide some people who will run errands, grocery shopping or whatever, for people that need to stay at home uh, for their, their own health and safety. And so um, we're working out the logistics, exactly what that's going to look like, but we need people who are willing to say, yeah, I can, I can run to the store or whatever for somebody if I'm needed. So if you're willing to do that, just let us know and we'll, we'll put your name on a list and we'll as we work out how that's going to look. And if you're somebody who, who has a need or you know someone who's going to need somebody to run some errands for them, communicate with us. Let us know what needs there are, and we're happy to help out. Another opportunity that we recognize is there are a lot of kids who are going to be at home who are normally at school, and they're, they rely on the school lunch for their food. And there, there are families in our community who... Uh, are not going to have enough food at home for their kids during this time when they're, they're off for an extended period. And so um, the youth assistance program through Hamilton Heights is sort of running point on making sure that we get lunches to all the families who need lunches uh, during this time. And our role in that is just to make sure that our local food pantries have plenty of food for them to use. They're going to use the local food pantries to, um, to get the food to take to the homes of the people who need it. And so we're donating peanut butter and jelly and bread and fruit and things like that to Angel's Attic uh, this week. So if you have some of that or you want to go get some of that and, and uh, take it uh, to Angel's Attic, you can do that. Or if you just want to make a financial donation to them, you can do that as well so they can buy what they need. So that's number two. And number three, uh, another unique opportunity that we have is this sort of forced slowdown that a lot of our families are going to experience over the next few weeks. This like, all of our extracurricular activities have been canceled, so what are we going to do (laughs) for a month, right? And we think it's a great opportunity. We really believe in the spiritual principle of Sabbath, of building a rhythm of rest into your life. And so we want to help people take advantage of this because I'm sitting here looking at my two kids going, they're, they're bored already. What are we, we going to do for the next month? And so 
our next gen department has put together some resources for families that we're going to be sending out to help you make the most of this extra time at home. So if you have kids at home or grandkids that are going to be at home uh, and for an unusual period of time, how can you make the most of that time? Instead of just watching more TV, what can you do? And so we're going to send resources uh, out uh, over email and social media and different things. We may even send some physical things out so that you you have some opportunities to engage your kids in some conversations that really matter and make the most of your time at home together. So those are the three ways that we know right now that we can step in and help and, and hopefully make a difference. And as other needs are made uh, are brought to our attention, we'll, we'll find ways to try to meet those as well. And so we're, we're going to be not afraid. We're going to be kind. We're going to be prepared to step in and help. That's, that's our posture right now. Um, we don't know what the future is going to hold, right? We, we have no idea what's about to happen uh, tomorrow or the next day. So we're just going to continue to monitor. We're going to rely on information from the health department, from our state government, and um, make decisions based on that information about how we can step in and help. So some things may change. Will we be here next Sunday? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> you know, we'll let you know, right? We're going to monitor and, and we're going to try to continue to be wise, make responsible decisions. Um, but we're always going to be ready to be motiv motivated, mobilized to help. This is our history, right? This is what Christians have been doing for centuries. If you go all the way back to the second century, the emperor of Rome uh, in uh, like 120 AD, Hadrian, had asked somebody to find out what is going on with this group of people? They, they called themselves followers of the way. Um, other people called them Christians. He was like, tell me about these people. I want to know what's going on with them. They're, they're a mystery. So the report that came back to him was, the, these people just live differently. They're, they're just a whole different breed of humanity. Because what they do is, when, when we, we send sick people out of our homes uh, to, to abandon them, the Christians go and get them and bring them into their own homes. When we abandon babies because they're, they're not wanted or they're born with some kind of uh, abnormality, the Christians go and get the babies, and they take them and raise them as their own. These people are willing to risk their own health and wealth and prosperity. When other people need food and the Christians don't have enough food, they will all fast until there's enough food collected that they can give to the needy. They're just different. We don't understand people like this. And they sort of operate without this fear of death. They just don't seem to be afraid of dying, which is strange, and we don't get it. And we're like, oh, we get it. We get it. We, we don't, we're not afraid of death. We're not, we're not afraid. We don't operate out of fear. And that's our history. That's, that's our people. That's who we are. We're, we're, we're descended spiritually from those folks who made a reputation for themselves by stepping in to needs and opportunities, even, even at their own risk, even at their own cost. And so that's who we are. That's who we're going to be. That's the way of Jesus. That's what he modeled for us. So we're going to continue uh, to do that. And we'll keep you posted on changes and opportunities to help. If you have an idea or way that you think we can help, come and talk to us. We're happy to to entertain other options. We probably didn't think of everything. So um, I'm going to go ahead and preach the sermon that I, I wrote a couple weeks ago and have been planning to preach because God knows what he's doing. This thing is going to line right up with what we need to talk about and hear today, uh, even before we knew that this is what we needed to hear. So uh, we're starting a new series called Meant to Be, and this will carry us all the way through to Easter, which is coming. I, I, I hope that we don't cancel Easter. Easter's like the, my favorite day of the year. So uh, Easter's coming. We're going to be excited about Easter. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about the, the person that you are meant to be. I think we're all created with this version of ourselves that we are meant to be. What, what does that look like and how do we get there? Well, it, it looks like a partnership with God. From the very beginning, God uses the word covenant over and over again to talk about his relationship with people. It's this, a covenant is a partnership. It's saying, I've, I've got my part. I'm going to do this part. I, I promise to do this. And, and you've got your part. And this is, this is what you're going to promise to do. And, and we're going to work together. We're going to work together to minister in the world that I've created. That's that's the partnership. That's the relationship that we've been created for. And what we are meant to be, the person you are meant to be, is this person who is in this partnership with God, trusting him to do his part and you doing your part. 
But we've got some serious obstacles to uh, really entering into this partnership and staying in it and staying committed to it. And we're going to go over uh, four of those different obstacles that keep us from uh, being the person that we're meant to be, being in this relationship, this partnership with God, and how we can overcome those. Or basically, we're going to see how Jesus sort of fulfills and overcomes each of those obstacles and teaches us to do the same. The first one that we're going to talk about today is control. Control, our desire to control our circumstances, our situation in life, or even people around us, control is an obstacle to us partnering with God. Can you see how that could possibly be? How when we try to take control of the things that are God's job, then we're not really working in partnership with Him anymore. We're working in opposition to Him. It doesn't feel that way all the time, but that's really what we're doing. So let's take a look uh, how this comes up in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn there. In Genesis chapter 2, it does not take human beings very long to figure out that they like to be in control. Are you are you a control person? Do you well? You, you don't know, but your spouse knows. So just ask your spouse, am I a control person? And they will tell you, right? And you can't hit them because it's church. And so you have to just like, you know, you have to just take it for now. You can yell at them later. But it doesn't take human beings on to figure out this is what we really like to be. Everything started out really good for them. Let's just see how it started out and then uh, what it turned into. In the uh, Genesis 2, uh, let's start in verse 8. Uh, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God makes a beautiful place for people to live. Uh, Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Uh, Verse 22. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Were not ashamed. So that's how we know they were content. They were so comfortable with their own bodies. They didn't wear clothes and they were fine with it, right? That's that's the picture of contentment right there. They were not in control. God was in control, and God invited them into this partnership. He gave them a work to do. He said, listen, you care for the garden that I made, and you will get to enjoy the fruit. That was the deal. That was the partnership. You care for the garden that I made, and you get to enjoy the fruit. We're going we're gonna to work together. I'm the creator. I'll make the stuff. I'll make beautiful, good things. And you're going to step into the creation that I made, and you're going you're gonna to actually make it better. You're going you're gonna to produce good things out of it, and then you get to enjoy the good things that are produced. That's the partnership. There's only one rule. Let me be the one who defines right and wrong. That's what the tree of knowledge of good and evil is all about, is God saying, I, I am the one who defines what's good and what's evil. And if you'll agree to let me be the one who defines good and evil then you care for the garden that I made, you get to enjoy the fruit. How long did that last? How old were Adam and Eve when uh, they fall to the temptation? I'm guessing about 15. It's a teenager joke. Don't worry about it. It's just, it's okay. It's all right. Slow crowd today. Let's, Let's just read the Bible. You know, I'll just stop talking. Okay. Uh, Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die if you, eat this, if you eat from this tree. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You can almost hear the serpent whispering into Eve's ear, surely you're not content with this arrangement. Yeah, I know, God, God has provided some good things for you. He's, this garden is beautiful, but, but he's denied something to you. This opportunity to decide good and evil for yourselves, surely you're not content with that. Wouldn't it be better if you could decide what was right and wrong for you? 
instead of letting God do that? Wouldn't it be better? And, and, and you can see the wheels turning, and she's thinking, well, maybe, maybe it would be better. Maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe, maybe it would be better if I was in control of my own life. So Adam and Eve take control. They decide to define what's right and wrong for themselves. And immediately, they realize that they're not content being naked in front of each other anymore. Like, this, is, this doesn't feel right anymore. Something's wrong. we got to put some clothes on. What, what are clothes? Let's find clothes. Let's make some clothes, you know. And God helps them out and makes some clothes for them. Because discontentment enters the world for the first time when people try to take control for themselves. And there are consequences for this. Let's look in verse uh, 22 of chapter 3. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reached out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So God says, Okay, if people are going to decide good and evil for themselves, we know where that's going to lead. There's going to be destruction and pain and suffering that come out of that. So we can't let them also live forever. Like, that sounds like a really bad idea. Is these people who are going to decide good and evil for themselves and cause a lot of pain and death and destruction, we can't let them also live forever. And so these two things are mutually exclusive. You can't, you can't decide right and wrong for yourself and have eternal life. And God says, you, we're separating those two. So they're, they're out of the garden that God made, this beautiful place where all their needs were met, They have opted out because they'd rather have control than enjoy the creation that God has provided for them. And before we are too tough on Adam and Eve, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We would often rather have control and decide right and wrong for ourselves than trust God and enjoy the benefits or the blessings of this relationship that he's invited us into. We are our own worst enemy. There is a me you're meant to be, and the greatest enemy of me becoming the me that I'm meant to be is me. That's actually fun to say. Do you want to say that with me? Let's, let's say it all together. It's up on the screen. It's fun. You ready? Here we go. The greatest enemy to becoming the me I am meant to be is me. Do you believe that? Do you agree with it? Because this is not our first response. Usually, our first response is to say, it's not my fault. We we blame our circumstances. Usually, first of all, we blame our circumstances. If only I had a better job. If only I made more money. If only I had less debt. If only I lived somewhere warm, you know? Wouldn't everything be better? If only this would change. And so we say, I'm going to take control of my life until I can change my circumstances, and then I'll give control back to God. So we blame our circumstances, and then we blame people. Well, if only my husband would, or if only my wife wouldn't, if only my father had, if only my mother wouldn't have, and we blame people around us. If only my boss would, if only my coworkers would, if only my kids would, right? And so we say, I'm going to take control back until I can get the people around me to meet my expectations, to act in ways that benefit me, and then I'll give it back to God but he's clearly not fixing the people around me and he's not fixing my circumstances, so maybe I need to be the one in control. Here's the problem with that. We stink at being in control. (laughs) We know that. We know that. The greatest enemy to me, being the me I'm meant to be, is me. The biggest obstacle to me enjoying the peace and joy and purpose for which I was created is me, my own decisions, my own choices. When I take control, I just make things worse. Uh, Any of you guys have remote control wars in your home? Remote control wars? No? No, just me. Okay, so thank you. I got one honest person. When I was uh, a kid, when we, we got our first remote control, I was the remote control until I was about 12. It was, Adam, go change the channel. That was the remote control, right? And, until we got a remote control, my, and, and then when we got one, my dad was the remote control guy. Like, he, he was in charge of what we watched, and so it was a lot of Star Trek is what we watched, really. <laughs> and I was like, Duke's a hazard, and he was like, Star Trek. So, so we watched a lot of Star Trek because dad was in control of the remote. He had the authority. He decided, you could, you could make your vote. We could all vote, but 
He was the one in control. And as I got older, I wasn't content with that. And so the goal was to sit down on the couch before dad so you can grab the remote. And then you just, just hold on to it. Just be stubborn. Don't let him have it, right? We don't even do that. You, just, you can just talk. You can just say, Alexa, change the channel or, you know, Google or whatever. You can just control it that way. But I think this is this picture of what it looks like between us and God. We are, we are fighting for control with him. We're like, I know you, I know you, you want control. You think you should, but I, just let me have it for a minute. Just let me watch what I want to watch for just a half an hour, right? One episode of Dukes of Hazard. Come on, God. And we, we fight back and forth between us and God for, for control. Just let me decide. Let me do what I want just for a moment. And that battle for control just kills our contentment. And so we continue to be discontent in life. And we were meant to be content. We were created for contentment. This kind of, when you read about the Garden of Eden, you're like, oh, man, that would have been nice. They just blew it. Why did they blow it? They had everything they needed right there. Why did they blow it? We've been fighting and looking for that contentment ever since. Well, Paul uh, is a, an apostle who comes after Jesus, and he teaches people how to follow Jesus, and he had some of this figured out. So we want to see what Paul has to say about contentment and control, see what we can learn from him. In Philippians chapter 4, we're going to read verses 4 to 13, and we're going to get to a verse here that you're probably going to be familiar with. You may even have it tattooed on your wrist or something somewhere. So pay attention. Here it comes. Uh, verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So he's speaking to this church in Philippi who's, who Paul started the church and he cares about this church and they care about him and they know that he's in prison and they've been wanting to help, haven't had a chance to help. Now they've found a way to help and Paul's like, thanks for the help. Verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am, to be content. Maybe that's the one you should have tattooed on your ankle. Philippians 4.11. Have you learned in whatever situation you're in to be content? Huh. Verse 12. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You recognize that one? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What's the context that we usually hear that verse? You see it, you know, printed on the eye black of football players, right? Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. I can, I can score touchdowns in the name of Jesus. Or you've got this, you've got this big challenge ahead of you. You've got a big test you have to take. And, and I know I can do that. I can do all things. I've got this project at work that I've got to finish, and it's really stressful. But I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Right? That's the context usually. I think it's fine to apply that verse in other situations, but that is not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about an even more amazing accomplishment than scoring touchdowns in the name of Jesus. He's talking about being content in any situation. That sounds like an accomplishment, doesn't it? And Paul says, let me tell you how I do that. Jesus, that's his answer. How, how am I content? If I have nothing or if I'm wealthy, Paul says, I've been in both situations, and I was content. How do, how do we do that? He's, he derives his strength from Jesus to find contentment no matter the situation. And I think what Paul demonstrates in his life and what he teaches his people is that when we let Jesus be in charge, we can be content. When we chase contentment, or chase control, it crushes our contentment. Control and contentment are opposed to each other. They will not coexist. If you are fighting for control, you are discontent. You cannot have both. But if we will give control to Jesus, then maybe we can be content. I, I think that we've seen a lot in the last few days, a couple weeks, of people wishing they had more control. How many of you wish that you had a little more control over the situation that you're in? Somebody has made a decision that you didn't agree with. Somebody has declared an opinion publicly that you thought was crazy, and you thought, man, if, if they would just, if I could just speak, if they would just listen to me for a minute, if I had more control, I would do things differently. And we fought for that control. It doesn't matter which, what your opinion is about the coronavirus. Um, you know somebody who disagrees with you, right? 
How many of you have an opinion? <laughs> yes? Some of you should raise both hands. <laughs> You have an opinion, and you know that there are opposing opinions out there. You may not know somebody personally, but you've heard them talk on the news, or you've seen them post on social media. There are some people who think this is all just being blown out of proportion, and people are acting crazy, and there's a lot of decisions being made that are just don't make sense. And you think that those people that are making those decisions, they're, they shouldn't be the ones in charge. They clearly don't know what they're talking about. Everyone needs to just calm down. And then there, are, you may be on the other side where you, you think, okay, I get it. This is pretty serious. I have loved ones that could be uh, at risk. And so would everybody just take a time out and figure out how to help, figure out how to, you know, stop this thing, slow it down? And, and you think the people who are not taking it seriously, you're like, what's wrong with you? Don't you love people? Why, why, are, you, why are you dismissing this like it doesn't matter? And it doesn't matter what side you're on. You feel some kind of tension between you and the people you disagree with. And that tension is this inability to control others. Like if everyone would just think like I think, the world would be a better place, right? Don't you think that? If, if everybody just agreed with me, where does that come from? That comes from a desire to control other people. Like if, if I could make you think like I think, what would you do with that power? If you had the power to make other people think like you think, would you use it? Oh, yes. Some of you are like, yes, sign me up. I didn't know you could wish for that. I'm going to wish for that now. But we were never meant to be in control of other people. What if you take whatever opinion it is that you have about the response to coronavirus and just kept it to yourself? <laughs> what if you did that? Is there any harm that's going to come from that? I'm not saying don't do anything. I'm not saying have a response. But I'm saying when, when we exert our opinion and we try to use it to control other people, we have overstepped our bounds. That is not our job. What is our job? How do we respond? How do we pursue contentment when we don't have control? Jesus makes it very clear. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives one of the longest teachings on any one subject that he gives in all of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about worry. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink, about your body, what you're going to wear. He says, actually, that's, that's pagan behavior. That's people who don't believe in God, who don't follow God. That's what they do. They worry about stuff, about physical, material, temporary, superficial things. That's what the pagans do. Jesus says, but you, you're different. You, you don't need to do that. Here's what you should do instead of worry. What does he say? Matthew 6, But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus is pointing to this partnership, this covenant that we were created for, this me that I was meant to be. I was meant to be a person in relationship with God. And that's what Jesus captures in this one sentence, this, this covenant partnership. You seek God's kingdom. God will take care of everything else. You seek the things. Let the things that matter most to God be the things that matter most to you. And God will take care of everything else. And what matters most to God? People, people have always been what mattered most to God. I think some of us were raised to think differently. We were raised to, to think that rules is what mattered most to God. Well, just keep the rules and, and God will be happy. But the reason why there are rules at all is so that we won't destroy the people around us. People are the reason for the rules. People have always been what mattered most to God. And so to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is to pursue the peace of other people, to meet the needs of other people, to approach other people with grace and truth. That's what matters most to God. That's seeking first the kingdom. And when you do that, Jesus says, here's the promise. God will take care of everything else. This goes against human nature. Our natural response is I have to take care of me. I have to take care of me and mine. I have to make sure that I get what I need, that I'm protected, I'm safe. And Jesus' whole point in this discourse in Matthew 6 is you don't have to worry about you. God loves you. God 
provides for you. God protects you. Let God do His job, and you do yours. Let God do His job, and you do yours. This is what we're called to. So this is what that looks like for us. We just got a few questions that I think we need to ask ourselves in relation to these three elements of our response. Our number one response is trust. So we need to ask this question, am I trusting God or am I trying to be in control? Am I trusting God or am I trying to be in control? Which is it? Because you can't do both. Are we going to let God be God? Let him be in charge of the things that only he can really be in charge of. Listen, you can't change people. If you've been married any length of time, you know this, right? If you've been a parent any length of time, you know this. You can't change people, but guess who can? God can. You can't fix all your circumstances and make them like you want them. You can't do that, but God can bring good out of every situation. So do you trust him or are you trying to be in control? Question number two, how am I making it better for others? This is what it looks like to seek first the kingdom of God is to ask this question. If people are what matters most to God, then people have to be what matters most to me. How am I making it better for others? And let me just go ahead and cast a little light on something for you. You shouting your opinion at the top of your voice is not making anything better for others. You're not helping. You can't change people's minds. It's not really even your job. How are you making it better for others? I don't don't mean that we should stuff the truth down deep inside of us and not let anyone know what we think. But there's a level that we get to where we try to manipulate or coerce or browbeat or guilt trip or shame other people into thinking like we think. And we should stop way short of that. It's just not helpful. The question is, how am I making it better for others? So I've shared some things with you that our church family has decided to participate in. Uh, You know, we're going to run errands for people. We're going to help stock our food pantries. We're going to provide resources for families. Those are not the only things out there. What, what do you see? What, what's going on in your neighborhood? What's going on in your workplace? What's going on in your family? How are you making it better for others? What's your contribution? Because when you seek first the kingdom of God, he takes care of everything else. And the last question is, am I able to relax and enjoy freedom under God's control? Just chill. <laughs> Am I able to relax and enjoy freedom under God's control? What would Paul say if Paul were standing here right now? I have learned to be content in any situation because I know my job and I know God's job and I'm not going to try to do his job and I'm not going to ask him to do mine. Here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want our community to look around right now and go, where is God in the midst of this? I don't want our community to ask that question. I think that's the question that comes to people's minds a lot when when disaster strikes, tragedy happens, people are afraid. People say, where is God? I want our community to know exactly where God is in this situation by our actions, by what we do. Our community should know exactly where God is. Where is God in this situation? Well, he, his hands and feet... The followers of Christ are making it better for as many people as they possibly can. That's where God is. He's working through us to relieve pain and suffering, to comfort those who are afraid, to provide for the needs of those who can't provide for themselves. That's where God is, and he's doing it through us. So that's our goal. Let let the community not wonder where God is. Let them know exactly where God is in the midst of this by seeing what we do. So trust him. Do you trust him? Are you trying to take control? What are you doing to make it better? And can you relax and enjoy the freedom of God being in control? Isn't that one year great? If if you think about your parenting history, when when your kids were just requiring a lot of time and energy and attention from you, weren't, weren't some of your favorite moments the moments when they went somewhere else and you could just relax? Like, I'm not in charge of my kids right now. Isn't that great? Somebody else is in charge of them. I can just relax, right? Guess what? 
You, you can relax. You're not in charge of the world. You're not in charge of how everything is going to happen. You're not in charge of tomorrow. You can relax knowing that God is in control. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and he will take care of everything else. If we live that out, our community will see God at work in a way that draws people to Jesus. Isn't that what we want? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this message that we get from your word, from the life and teaching of Jesus, from the life of Paul, to have this reminder that you, you love us, that you have power to act on our behalf, that you are able to bring good out of any situation, that you have promised to provide for your people. So may we just rest in that. May we trust you. And may that trust then set us free to really step in and contribute to the needs around us in ways that make a difference. God, we pray all of this will point people to Jesus. He's the one who needs to be the star. He's the one that we want everyone's eyes to be on. Is the one who bought us and redeemed us and has invited us into a partnership. May we find contentment in that. In Christ's name, amen.